One, two, three. I'm Microsoft teaming with Microsoft Teams. I'm learning and dreaming with Microsoft Teams. The hub and the teamwork of Microsoft 365 in these formating times. I'm Microsoft teaming with Microsoft Teams. Yeah. With Microsoft Teams. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Inside Microsoft Teams. I'm your host, Stephen Rose, and this is episode 502, where we will talk about reducing complexity and improving productivity with our guest today, Kent State University. Now, Kent State is a research university. They were established in 1910 in Kent, Ohio, which is a little southeast of Cleveland. They have over 2,600 academic staff, over 6,800 administrators, and over 37,000 students in 12 different academic colleges, from aeronautics and architecture environmentalism to brain health research institutes and public health. They're also famous alumni, like John DeLance, Q from Star Trek fame, Steve Harvey, three members of Devo, Chrissy Hine, Captain Underpants creator Sean McArdle and John Judy and coaches Nick Saban and Lou Holtz. So quite a lot of pretty amazing folks across a lot of diverse areas and some of my favorite uh, punk rock and rock bands too. But joining us today is Vice President of IT and, CI, uh, and CIO John Rathke. So John, how are you this morning? Stephen, I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to spend some time with you today. Awesome. Take a moment and kind of talk about yourself. You have a, a pretty impressive resume with kind of how you've taken the overall university's information, technology, environment, and vision. But go ahead and take a moment, kind of talk about yourself and what you do there at Kent State. Well, I appreciate that. I think everyone who is in this particular chair wants to do their best to ensure that the mission of their institution is well served. If you think about it, IT really integrates across the entire mission and works with every division to ensure that its objectives, its goals, its aspirations can be met. And it's rather exciting when you think about it. Um, I wasn't always in education. I've had the good pleasure of being in industry, an entrepreneur, being in healthcare. But when I came to education about 15 years ago, I, I just fell in love with it. Um, it's a wellspring of eternal youth, just incredibly bright and uh, folks who, who think about the future, who think about the issues of today, uh, highly collegial and, and looking to work together. And that was the environment that just felt right for me. And so I'm very glad to be here at Kent State. We have an incredible organization, great leadership, and our student body is amazing. Awesome. So as we were talking, we were talking about a few specifics, and there were four areas that you, as we were talking about Kent State and what they're doing before we even got into Teams, that there were four kind of key tenets that you really wanted to bring into the role and bring to Kent State. And that was, first and foremost, focusing on students via access to education and completion. Number two was to create the best experience possible, reduce complexity, improve productivity, and finally to extend communication to collaborate and especially into learning environments. So how, you know, talk a little bit about how did you do that? How do you reduce complexity and how do you make sure that what is a great experience for one person can be a good experience for somebody else who has a totally different perspective on what that is? You, you know, you ask maybe the hardest question right out of the gate, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it, That's right? That's the purpose, so, yes. You know, one of the... Um, tenants of the approach that we have is that uh, we really desire to provide an incredible digital experience. But experience isn't measured by our own standards. It's really measured by those that we serve. And so in order to get to that level or that point, Stephen, what we need to do is listen first. We really yeah. need to understand what are people trying to do? What are, where are their pain points? What are the opportunities that they see? And how can we create consistency so that the complexity of an organization like Kent State, or quite frankly, any organization of, of any size, how can we reduce that complexity so that there isn't time lost, there's actually value gained? Right. Uh, that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, mm -hmm. That happens because we have a great team who is listening and working together to identify those areas that we can improve so that the digital experience is consistent. It's available 24 by seven by 365, no matter your geographic location. 
And it's personalized to understand who you are, your role, the time of year, the sort of things that you may need to do. Um, and, and that's kind of our focus, right? How do we put the student at the centerpiece to ensure that we're doing everything we can to help them move from their communities through our, through our university access to completion and then enjoying industry in their career and, and stay with them as their skills um, mature and as they have need to continue to advance in their careers. Now that's a lot and that's hard enough to do as it is, but with COVID, that's going to just magnify and intensify that. So let's talk a little bit about, first of all, pre-COVID, you decided to reduce some of that complexity by bringing out teams for phone and, you know, because phone and email alone provides a lot. So what were some of the lessons learned? You rolled out teams and I know there were a few things that, you know, IT efforts have to be top down and some change campaigns. So let's talk about that before we get into how you're using it now and how you've used that to achieve those goals that we just talked about. Yeah. So, Stephen, I think maybe just to, to kind of level set on please why why choose teams? Well, um, teams on its own is a fantastic uh, environment, a fantastic platform. But what Teams has the advantage of that other platforms don't is integration with the way we do work, right? The things that we need to be productive and, and the way we approach things. Uh, if we're going to reduce complexity, one way to reduce complexity is to reduce your portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, think about this for a second from, from just a toolbox perspective. You know, how many screwdrivers do you actually need in the toolbox? You really need the ones that are important. And so working with my leadership team, I said, look, let's let's go ahead and think about those things that can be the most valuable to us in the way we work. We need to be able to communicate with each other. We need to be able to collaborate. We need to be able to ideate. We need to be able to uh, learn and continue to grow and foster ways in which uh, we engage others across our division and across campus. So we, we made some decisions. We're simply going to use one of the great tools that we have and that is Teams because it extends itself very, very well. So as we moved into the Teams environment, um, we recognized that it really fulfilled four or five other tools that we had. And so we collapsed those tools out of our portfolio. And by bringing more people into the environment and their ideas on how to use the tools, we found that we were enhancing and extending the use of Teams almost immediately. Um, well, let, me, let, me, let me stop you there. Let me ask you yeah. something. Because when you remove tools, some people go, wait a minute, I use that tool every day. What do you mean the tool you're going to give me is just as good? How do you deal with that? Um, by asking questions, actually. And the questions were, well, what about that tool that we are potentially deprecating? What about that tool that you really liked? Right. What was the function you were trying to use it for? Um, how might we do that in Teams? Let's give Teams a try. Tell me what your feedback is on Teams. So initially, there was no mandate. Initially, it was, we really want to identify how this tool could be the tool of the future for us. Um, and that, you know, we were certainly prepared to say we're all going to use it. But we introduced it as the tool of choice. We listened to feedback. We had a few early adopters who became subject matter experts, if you will. They were the champions of how to use it. They researched things. They explored things on their own. And then we taught each other the lessons that we were learning. Hey, did you know you could do this? Hey, did you understand this? And then did you know you could integrate that? Uh, so we created a community of practice around the use of teams within our own division. So integration is really key. It's it's having everything in one place, but I love the fact you're talking about getting that feedback from your end users and getting them to take an emotional state. You're taking my tool away from me into a more visceral state of, well, hey, what did you use it for and why can't you use this and get them away from emotion to fact, which is 
one of the hardest things because people are very emotional about, hey, I, I need this to get my job done and you may be not allowing me to do that and going through that. Was that just, you know, what was it different types of feedback? Some would be chat, some would maybe be a questionnaire or form. How did you engage folks on that? Because not everybody communicates that the same way. And again, going from that emotional state to more of a logical state is a big jump for some folks. I think one of the ways, Stephen, that that feedback came back to me um, was one, I was direct, uh, directly engaged with my division. I, I have a conversation cafe monthly, and it's mm -hmm. a drop-in meeting where anybody can come into the room where I'm at. Uh, there's coffee, and we'll just have open dialogue about uh, things that they're interested in, what's going on in the world, and inevitably it leads to the things we're doing and how we're doing those things. So that was one. And, and because I didn't make it a mandate, people had a sense of objectivity and that they sure. could share their thoughts about how it was going. Um, we also looked at adoption. Um, who was using it? How much were they using it? Was there something that we could do to assist them if there was a discomfort anywhere? or maybe um, a lack of understanding of how to do the things they're used to doing. Uh, so it's, you know, not only did we listen at the beginning, we really wanted to listen throughout and we all grew as a result of that as well. Um, we learned things that maybe it did incredibly well and some things we, we knew maybe we wanted to work around uh, if it didn't fit exactly how we needed something to happen. But in time, what we found is that it, it can do everything we need and it does it very, very well. And uh, you know, since we've been using it now for four years, um, you know, it continues to mature as well. And it's, it's outpacing our ability to, to actually learn some of the new things that are there. Wow. So one of the big things that you brought in was workflow and Power BI and turned it into uh, Kent State Tools. And what I would love to do is I would love to take a look at a demo of the Kent State Tools and have you sort of walk us through that a little bit. Absolutely, let's do that, Stephen. Microsoft Teams is a centerpiece of our digital experience and it's growing number of use cases with the Microsoft solution set to support outcomes. One of the areas that I'd like to share with you is that of collaboration and one way in which we collaborate. And I've chosen uh, it, a governance site to support that, of course, as we build agendas. Everybody's familiar with using common tools for that. We also do voting in this site on any off-cycle meeting needs that we have. Uh, we can put the issue in front of the membership and identify uh, how they might feel about it so that they can support uh, a direction forward prior to having to meet. We also do a fair amount as it relates to metrics so that we can determine how we're doing against our stated purpose of prioritization. Uh, in this case, looking at uh, projects and estimated hours and actual hours to keep us on target. But one area I'd also like to share with you is how we're supporting uh, information around subdomains. And this is interesting because of how it integrates Power BI into Teams. Now, what you're seeing here actually is a Power BI application uh, demonstrating how structured and unstructured data can come together in a very visual way to represent a living document, if you will, in support. We can identify who's involved in the Data Governance Council, members from different teams and their role uh, we also have data classification standards with definitions to help us identify those data attributes that would find themselves in one of those categorizations. And our data dictionary helps us with terms that are unique so that each of those terms, when used, is used in a very common way and is traceable from point of origin through transaction uh, to reporting. 
And our data usage guideline uh, demonstrates to us the data type and, and how it might be identified within where it's permitted, where it's not permitted. And then if we have any questions about how to handle something, we have a flow chart that helps all of our community navigate that uh, territory. So very interesting uh, use of integrating teams as the central point of hub for collaboration and communication, but in that case, Power BI uh, to demonstrate an outcome. We also have some very interesting forms of automation that we're doing from within teams. And I'd like to give you an example of one that actually is being developed by our students. And this is a student-led initiative from our Digital Leadership Academy. And our Digital Leadership Academy are a teams of students that work together under a mentor of our team to solve problems. They're highly collaborative teams, uh, usually doesn't involve all the same skill in a team. For instance, we could have project managers, communications, functional requirements, documentation, development, etc. But in this particular case, we work with a division uh, where they were doing things very, very manually, and it took them way too long to accomplish simple tasks for uh, a simple project management system. And we automated this particular process for them, first of all, by listening to what they wanted to do and then identifying tools that our students could integrate in order to create a very automated and a process. So in this case, we used forms, which integrates into planner, uh, which provides information back into SharePoint and, and then Power BI uh, to automate outcomes. And let me give you an example uh, of this. So first is an intake form, uh, and I won't go through this entire thing, but it's a way for somebody to come in and say, hey, look, I need a, I have a request. I want to do something, and, and they go forward with that. From the intake form, uh, they take a look at the uh, marketing requests to say, okay, these new requests have come in, and this is a planner board, and then an individual can click on something that needs to be triaged, all of the information from that form is populated automatically into a planner tab, including any attachments that may have been included and uploaded using the form. Of course, this can be common. And then this is then triaged and it goes to a particular group to handle. Uh, so at any given time, um, individuals can come into the reporting side and see that there is work that's been done and work that needs to be done. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, project led by students using all Microsoft tools with Teams as the hub. This saved over 200 hours a year of labor. Um, and What's interesting also is the triage went from a two-day process to being done in just minutes. So very, very valuable using Microsoft Teams in this particular way. Another way that we use Teams is to recognize um, our staff and to support our community. We have uh, a number of ways in which our team stays connected and belongs uh, within the division, just keep on doing IT, people post different things. But we also have an employee recognition uh, component in here that is open to the entire campus. And so if we go to news and announcements, this is actually a SharePoint site that is leveraged within Teams. The SharePoint site is a way to get at a whole bunch of different information about IT, but one of those is an employee recognition program uh, where somebody can look at the different ways to recognize somebody and notice it's personalized, comes in here. We use forms that's embedded, uh, submit that information, and then it goes to our leadership team uh, to take a look at who has been recognized and how we might vote on those different uh, recognitions and support of our staff. So, you know, what's next? 
there's a lot of different things that we're going to be thinking about, including the development of bots to automate and scale different parts of the organization within teams. And we're just thrilled with what we can do with teams as centerpiece of our organization's delivery. Awesome stuff. We'll be back with John in just a few moments, but uh, a few weeks ago, we released our blog post for the public preview of Microsoft Teams Connect Share Channels. We've had a lot of questions, including folks that were at the M365 conference, so we thought it'd be great to sit down with some members of our engineering team and ask some questions. So let's take a look at that right now. Teams Connect, Arun Das, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Stephen? I'm doing great. I'm so excited about Teams Connect. I just got back from the M365 conference and we had more questions on how do I set this up? How do I get in the public preview? So I thought it'd be great to go through that and demo that. But before we do, take a moment and tell folks who you are. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, my name is Arundas. I am a PM on, on Microsoft Teams and I specifically focus on making channels awesome for our users. And I'm pretty thrilled by the reception our Teams Connect Share Channels has got in public preview. I'm happy to talk about it. Let's explain what it is. So you can add a guest to your tenant, but we yeah. really feel that Teams Connect is the best way to work with people both inside and outside of your org. Now, let me see if I have this right. So we can create a team, yeah. and then we create a channel within the team known as a shared channel that we yeah. can invite people both inside and outside of our company, yeah. and it creates a sandbox for everything that we're working on, and it's only shared within that shared channel. Is that, yes. is that about right? Yeah, absolutely. And let me uh, let me talk about the whole idea of Teams Connect Share. Yeah, channels, please dig in. Right? Yeah. So if you look at channels, channels are where customers our customers do work. And our vision is to transform these channels to be open, collaborative workspaces where people across team and organizational boundaries can come, thrive, and work together. Right. So we obsessed over solving the friction points in the experience of collaborating externally and work with our customers and partners to iterate over the complete end user and admin experience. So we went back to the drawing board, we talked to our partners and Azure AD and fundamentally rethought the collaboration, right? So there were a bunch of innovations on user identity model, the tenant trust model and the channel membership model. And thanks to all the great work that team has done, now shared channels can be shared with pretty much any team within your organization or outside your organization and those members have access to that channel. The best part is when you're working with external partners, those partners don't have to tenant switch, which means they can see the channel in their channel list, which pretty much supercharges the ability for your external partners and people outside your team to work seamlessly. Made right. chat, and, it, and, it, and it's that sandbox. Everything you're doing in there is not being shared with everybody who's in the whole rest of the team. It's just for the folks in that shared channel. Exactly. Exactly. Simple, simple example, right? If you are part of marketing team and you want to bring somebody from legal, you can just mm -hmm. share that specific channel. And then the legal team has no idea what you're doing on all other channels. Right. Which is yeah. always a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's yep. no. <laughs> I was gonna say let's take a look at a demo because it's a lot easier to actually just demo this and see how to set this up and go through it. And then at the end we'll share some great resources. Okay. Yes. I'm super excited. Yes, we have a great set of tools for our admins to manage this experience uh, securely and in a compliant manner for the users. So let's jump into the demo. Yeah, so let's start with making sure you're set up for public preview appropriately. So there are two options. So if you go to Teams Admin Center and go to Teams Update Policies, you can update your policy. Uh, the recommended way is if you're already following Office Preview in current channel, then just select Follow Office Preview option. After that, your end users have to do nothing. They will automatically opt in into Teams Public Preview. But if you are not following that channel for Office Preview, you can always select Enabled. If you select Enabled, please make sure that your users opt in into Public Preview in Teams Client. When I jump to Teams Client, I will show you how to do that. But that's about what admins have to do to get enrolled into Public Preview. Once public preview is set up, if you're only using shared channels within your organization, you don't have to do anything, but it is always good to check your policies. So here I am in again in Teams Admin Center, but looking at Teams policies. So I go in and I see that there are multiple policies which allows you to govern the experience for your end users, creating a shared channel, who can invite external users, and who can participate in external shared channels. Uh, just a quick call out. Uh, the last two options require you 
to configure B2B Direct Connect using cross-tenant access policies, which I'll just talk about. So now I'm switching roles and I'm the AD admin or the Azure admin for my tenant. So here I am looking at external identities. You can always look up, look them up using the search and I jump to cross-tenant access settings. So for these demo, uh, all I'm doing is updating the default settings. You can always go to organizational settings and establish relationships with specific organizations. But just let's look at how does this thing work? And for this demo, what I'm doing is I am going and configuring my inbound access settings. What that means is when I want an external partner or an organization to come and collaborate in my organization, I will set up inbound access settings. And I will configure whether it is allowed for anybody from the outside world to come in or for specific organizations. If I'm doing specific org organizations, you can always go to organizational settings. Let me ask if, you a quick question. What is the yeah. difference between B2B collaboration and B2B direct connect? Because you have both of those there, and I think it's important yeah. for folks to understand the difference. Yeah, great question, uh, Stephen. So B2B collaboration manages B2B guest, as you know, right? So if you right. want to bring a guest into your tenant, you want them to be visible in your directory, then you use B2B collaboration. But if you're using specifically uh, shared channels and your collaboration scenarios are specific to channels and meetings and files, you should use B2B Direct Connect. Perfect. So shared channel uses B2B Direct Connect. So that's the one that you will be configuring when, where you would be using Microsoft Teams Connect shared channels. So inbound uh -huh. lets you define who can come in. And what is great is outbound lets you define who can participate in external tenants. So as an Azure AD admin, you have the keys to both the doors, like who comes in and who gets out, right? So here I have set it up in a way that, hey, anybody from my organization can participate in external channels or anybody from an external organization can come in. But the best thing is the control is with your users. You will have to invite external people. And for that, you need to know the email address of that party. So let me show an example, right? So imagine Contoso and Fabricam are two organizations that we all love are trying to set up shared channels. Here it is Murray who's trying to set up a shared channel. All she needs to go, she needs to be the owner of the team, go to the team and say add channel. Now she will see a drop down where she can select a shared channel. Imagine this channel has been set up. Now she wants to invite external people from Fabricam. She can go to the channel and say and share And we do channel. have that share channel icon right there that tells yes. us it's the share channel, which is yeah, important. That's a, yep. that's a great call out, Stephen, yep. because this is something we learned from our customers and we heard from our customers, hey, it's always good to indicate when the channel is a different channel type. So we right. have indicators for private channel, we have indicator for shared channel, yes. So your users will always be in the know if it's a shared channel. So now you can either share the channel with people or with a team, right? So mm -hmm. I select people. Here and I've this already will basically send them an invite, internal, external, and now they'll be able to join that, come in, and you'll be able to share right from there. Yeah, so for individuals, because this is set up, when you add them, they directly get added to the channel. But when you share with a team, you send <clears> the <throat> invite to the team owner, and they pick up the appropriate team, right? So here I just can type the whole email address and get the person. And once this is done, sharing is set up. So let me show what this would look like from the recipient standpoint. So this is Joe who's at Fabricam and imagine the channel was shared by Murray with Joe. So if only a single channel was shared with Joe, this is what the experience would look like. He would see the team. Hey, the channel comes from Contoso, and he will just see the channel name. And the not channel. all of the other channels that are part of that team and not click on those. You only see what you have yeah. access to. Yeah, perfect. Like they can collaborate with files, they can do apps, and they can do meetings. Now, if had it been, Murray had invited Joe's team, entire team, so Joe can go through the setup process. And once the channel is shared with the team Joe picks here, Right. market project team, the channel shows up in that team and everybody from that team gets access to the channel. And if you can see, there is an external indicator telling people that, hey, this channel is from another tenant. 
Right. Park, and we also see the, and we yep. see the share icon next to the name and up in the top yep. right hand corner as yep. well. Yeah. And the similar experience. So it's pretty much either you're working within the tenant or across tenant. The experience is pretty seamless, but you always know who your audience is with all the right set of indicators. Great stuff, Arun. I really appreciate this. Now, you've got a bunch of blogs and resources. We're going to put those all up on the screen. But what is your kind of final thought for Teams Connect? Who should really say, hey, we should start playing with this today? Yeah, in fact, when we built Teams Connect Share Channels, we built it with vision for all our customers. Like anytime you need to collaborate with people who are outside your team boundary, irrespective of whether they are part of your organization or not, Teams Connect Share Channels will serve its purpose by helping you collaborate more seamlessly and with more, far more efficiency. Awesome. Check out these great resources. Arun, thanks for taking time today. And we're going to get back to our episode. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen, for having me. Awesome stuff from Arun and our engineering team. And I want to remind folks on April 26th of our Microsoft Tech Community Live event, where you'll get a chance to ask more questions. Now, John, Thanks again for being with us. Um, question, what's next for Kent State? You're doing some really cool stuff with virtual reality and a lot of stuff. What are some of the things that um, that you're most excited about or going to be bringing to students there on campus? Well, that's the sort of question that's important as we think about the future. What, what are the ways in which we can continually raise the bar for the experience that we provide not only to students, but giving our faculty and our researchers and administration an opportunity uh, to really do what they do well. So we're thinking about um, extended uses of artificial intelligence and, and machine learning and, and Microsoft's technologies are at the heart of that. Uh, we're looking at extended reality. Uh, we're already using extended reality in our School of Podiatric Medicine, and we're looking at extending that into fashion, into aeronautics, and into our architecture schools as well. When we think about other opportunities, it really is looking more holistically at how we provide experiences to our students and thinking about ways in which we can use frameworks like Teams or the platform of Teams to support that academically, administratively, but into their careers as well. So we're looking at a lot of different ways to do that automating where we can and providing additional value uh, that we hear our constituents need. Let's share out some really great links. So Kent State University's Brain Health Research Institute at kent.edu slash brain health, their design innovation school at kent.edu slash design innovation. And we saw some great stuff with the Kent State University tool they're using, which is powered by Power BI and forms. And if you'd like to do more of that for your own company, come to build. May 24th through 26th. Registration begins late April at mybuild.microsoft.com. And of course, if you love coffee, join us for our next episode featuring the Clifton Coffee Roasters from the UK. That'll be on May 5th. So lots of great stuff. Check out Kent University. And John, I want to thank you so much for being on our show today. Well, Stephen, it was my pleasure. And absolutely, I would welcome the conversation and just share where we are and where we're headed. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great week and we'll see you on the next episode of Inside Microsoft Teams.